So without further ado, we're going to introduce uh, some of our students uh, who are working through the I Consult Collaborative under the direction of Mark Thomas, who's joining with us uh, today. Uh, I know our first group, but uh, I'll have you guys introduce yourselves uh, individually as you come on up. And if you, again, if you don't mind just speaking clearly in the mic so that the folks uh, virtually can hear you as well. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, uh, Okay, uh, so I'm Ravina Gangude, and I'm one of the program managers at iConsult Collaborative. Uh, so first of all, a little bit about iConsult. So this is a platform where all of you are encouraged to apply. You will get real-world experience working for like real clients, which can add value to your resume. So feel free to check our website on iConsult. And if you have like any questions, you can reach me or Shweta on LinkedIn as well. Uh, okay, so um, talking about my project, so before I begin uh, with the presentation, I would like to thank Professor Solis for giving us this opportunity. So uh, yes, giving a brief about my client, Terrify. So uh, Terrify, the client, they have developed a platform for healthcare professionals, then uh, recruiting agencies and uh, medical institutions. So what we're doing here is this platform helps the recruiting agencies and the healthcare professionals to tap into uh, data related to medical or physician level uh, high level data as well as look for job opportunities that align with their interest specific to a uh, market size. So that was a brief about Fairify. Uh, so uh, talking about what we specifically at I consult do for Verify. So um, if you look at the scope of the project, my team helps Verify in developing a uh, healthcare data aggregation and also uh, in geographic filtering system. So now if I reduce this uh, scope into high level deliverables, you can see we basically all help them in creating a user friendly platform to access the healthcare data then we are then implementing geographic filtering system using zip code or uh, mechanism. And uh, yes, so whatever data we analyze based on that insights, we help them to implement their platform and make it better for the users. So uh, the in-depth about all this work will be explained by the data scientist in my team. Hello, my name is Durgesh Kulkarni. I am a team member at iConsult. So I will be explaining what kind of model we have used to do our project. So basically our project is like to filter out the data using different categorization techniques. So basically uh, in data science, uh, famous, uh, famous categorization technique is clustering. So uh, you, you maybe have heard of like different kind of, kind of clustering techniques. So K-means is one of the most popular clustering techniques that we use. But uh, problem with the K-means clustering is like uh, the ways that you define or the clusters that you, that you define are automatic. You don't, you don't, you cannot put the clusters uh, with respect to the users. So in this case, uh, our client provided that the clusters that you put on every uh, column should be user defined. So based on uh, data analysis and our subject matter experts from our client, they gave us a different kind of weight to every columns. So that we have done. So basically, uh, that uh, the purpose of that was to enhance our uh, quality and relevance of clustering using this method. So that's why we use weighted clustering. So weighted clustering also uses a weighted distance metric to solve this problem. So basically, in K-means clustering, the distance metric is limited to only centroid. But in this method, we are uh, focusing on weighted distance metrics. So this improves our reliance on the clusters and uh, moreover. Uh, Every column get a different kind of uh, weights that is assigned by, uh, by SME and relevance of that column would be uh, given to different kind of zip code and uh, this kind of uh, adjustment influence how the data points contribute to different kind of cluster formation. So how we implement this would be explained by Arden. Uh, my name is Arden Kakade. I'm a second year grad student majoring in information systems and I'm uh, a proud member of iConsult working since January of 2023. Uh, thank you, Guruji, that was insightful about weighted clustering. Uh, 
So let's begin with what the data of the project was about and how, how does it resonate with our project. Our data consists of 70 different columns and 126 uh, unique values. Uh, we had different variables and attributes in our data like CBS code, which is basically code based statistical search area on which we are trying to implement the filtering feature on. And also we had to look for the important variables and metrics that were that, that would be useful in future for the filtering process. Now, I'll be explaining the implementation of the different features and machine learning techniques we had in the project. Why we why we use these machine learning techniques was the reason behind it not selecting different uh, different techniques. So starting uh, to just let you all know and make sure make sure make sure we are on the same page. We scripted the whole project and performed it in, uh, on our platform. That's the reason we started with with KMins clustering, we did KMins clustering package or library you can say and use the entropy weighted KMins uh, function. Uh, so this function and package gave us the exact desired output we wanted as well as the clients. But the problem here was uh, we couldn't assign any uh, custom weights to these variables that we like. And you see here the requirements from the client was something different that, than what was the desired output we had. So we had to we had to tweak a little bit, uh, break some a little bit and then we went on to a different approach where we created two different arrays, uh, one for all the variables and its uh, category values as well as the non-continuous values and one one, vari one one array for all the integers. So we we assigned the weights by multiplying all the integers to the different variables and its all, all the rows uh, by implementing the k-means feature and as well as custom weights. Uh, we thought this could be a good idea to get uh, what we wanted and also the client uh, thought would be happy about it. But the problem here we faced was about the low variance. Low variance is nothing but the difference between the cluster scores uh, independent of the weights assigned or not. And in this case, uh, the cluster scores were not much different when we assigned the weights and when we do not. So uh, when we tried out all the different packages in R, we had to go to the FlexPlus package. Now FlexPlus is one different other package uh, which is used for clustering. Also gives, a, gives us more flexibility and freedom to add our own custom weights. So we started on implementing with the C plus function, which is a function falls under the same flex plus package. Uh, the special thing about this uh, flex plus package, C plus, uh, C plus function is you can add your own weights into it. Uh, you can add your own function uh, parameters inside the function itself. So uh, let's say uh, you have to assign the weights and uh, the problem here, the, the primary problem here was we cannot assign our own custom variables to custom custom weights to all the variables. So we are, we are trying to tackle this problem and uh, that's where we find about the flex plus package and this gives us the freedom and flexibility to add our own weights to the variables. But we also offered the same, uh, we also came across the same problem here like uh, about the low variance and then finally we found out about the KCCA function which falls, falls under the same uh, flex plus package but the only difference that was differentiating uh, CC plus and the KCCA was the differentiating factor between the weights, uh, independent of the weights assigned to the variables or not. Uh, so that's the reason uh, why we went on and finalized flex plus KCCA as as I told it could effectively distinguish between the weighted and unweighted clusters. Now, now talking about the challenges we faced in, a, faced in this project, of course uh, it was it was a complex project and we had to face challenges. The challenges shows uh, how well we read out the challenges and it was an opportunity for us to improve in the zones that we will be, show where we were, where we were weak in specific zones. Uh, starting with the data process pre-processing, we had uh, faced problems in data inconsistency and normalization. We had to tweak in a little bit, uh, little bit in the column names as well because of the volatility in the requirements of the, the requirements of the requirements from the clients. Also we had to bring in the statistical feature, changing the missing values to the closest being possible. Also tweaking the columns and the statistical measures based on what output, what output we wanted and as well as the clients. So making sure that we are on the same page. Uh, this was the, the feature engineering was the biggest challenge we faced in the, in the whole project. It wasn't much complex project but it was time consuming. Uh, and the problem here was uh, when we initially, initially started to imply a clustering, uh, weighted clustering algorithms on our uh, non-continuous variables, those were just numbers given. But when we actually started to implement this uh, clustering, clustering algorithms to the categorical values, so we are not talking about here one or two different categories, but we faced a problem with 30 different categories. So uh, I have probably heard about W variables, what W variables is and why we use it. So we had to bring in W variables for to break down this process and make the whole project smoothly again. 
So we had 30 different categories. We had to bring in 29 different words, the variables, or in, in case just the variables is nothing but that creates a binary number 0 and 1 ascends to all different categories uniquely. Uh, let's say we have a we have a column of uh, we have a variable of let's say color and color has three different categories red, blue, green. So it's assigned one and zero to all the three colors. Uh, gives out one when the color is actual red and zero otherwise. So this was an integral factor uh, to overall make the project fast and slower. Uh, I mean, to our confusion. Uh, also for the literature survey, before starting on the project. Uh, we all in the team were from a different background. We had to universally brainstorm and do a lot of research about the healthcare domain as well as the current market value of the physicians, uh, how the market value and what the deciding factor would be <coughs> based on the data, what columns we should include in, what columns should we get rid of. Uh, it was time consuming but uh, as soon as we, we were on the same page about the what, what attributes we needed to bring in, uh, it was just a matter of time until we decide what the featuring selection and algorithms we are going to use it. Uh, and I would say the one major uh, problem we ever faced, I wouldn't say this is a problem, but this was more or less an opportunity for us to work on uh, with, with new clients and work on ourselves as well. So whenever we are able to uh, do any algorithm and do any uh, machine learning with the desired result that the clients want, uh, there was always change in the change in the requirements from the client side. So there were a few times where we have to come two or four steps, four steps backward and then we have to start all over again. But that literally showed us uh, what mistake we did and it was a learning opportunity for all of us. It uh, doesn't matter how, at what mediocre level, what intermediate level or advanced level, you are data scientist, there is always small and major mistakes you do, but always a good opportunity to learn. Uh, that's all. Lastly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Sons and Thomas Adler to uh, give us this curious opportunity. I'm really honored to present here this project in front of all of you. And we'd be happy to answer any of the questions you guys have. Thank you so much. So I think one way to do is we'll have the other team kind of give context about their project and then you can ask questions across all the people at the same time. Some of them might just be about I think so. And um, so while you come down, we'll get it set up. And while I'm here, I'll just point out to you in the room as well as online. So there was some technical terms for lack of a better way. Um, technical terms about like our packages and machine learning and stuff like that. So that's all learned in the high school. So if you've just taken the introduction to data science class, we haven't taken any of them. You take those classes, you're going to learn all those and much more as well. Thank you, Professor. Sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Shweta Rani. I am the program one of the program manager at iConsult Collaborative, and I'm very excited to be here with my teammates Arunima and Mohan. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Art and Professor Sols for giving us this opportunity to present on the occasion of Data Science Day. So today, uh, we are going to give you some insights and provide you with some updates on what our project and what we are doing at iConsult. So our client is new here. So just an introduction of what we, uh, what Nulia works is. So Nulia works is a software as a service or application that assists the users in utilizing digital technologies through personalized skill development. When I say personalized skill development, it means it unlocks the value of Microsoft 365 in the way that works best for you. So this is a snapshot of what is the existing application about. So this is the Nubia Works framework on the Microsoft Teams. As you can see, there are menus, home skills, outcomes, showcase, insights, etc. So what it gives a user is, it gives you a snapshot of your progress, also the status where you are in. So for example, if you, have, if you can see the skills section, it is showing us that you have attained 49 skills, 5 skills need attention, 2 are in service. Now you will see what is a skill. Skill is nothing but as easy as organize your outlook inbox with the folder. Or how you can communicate effectively to treat. This is what a skill is. Now, if anyone who is struggling to work or doesn't know how to use it, can just go to the try it option, perform the steps, or can go step by step guide and do as per what they want. So, in this way, the Nula application works. So, what, where does the icon team come into the picture? 
So what we understood was uh, currently they are, the client is focusing, uh, aiming towards moving into the educational domain and assisting the students to work on the same. So we as a high council team help them to understand the requirements. Firstly, gather the requirements and what exactly they need from us. Secondly, they, they are currently using Excel chart and uh, Excel charts to develop their uh, uh, application. So we are providing them efficiently uh, Power BI dashboards. So that is what we are doing. And of course, generating insights for the same. So in this way, we are helping the client to unlock some uh, efficient way of doing visualization techniques using the Power BI dashboard. Now in depth, my teammate Aruna will be explaining you what we have done so far. So uh, the initial thing that Shweta said was requirement gathering. That was the first step that our team members embarked upon. It was to understand how the data was being generated, what was the data pipeline like, and how it was being collected. So uh, the data was being generated on a weekly basis, and it was stored in a CSV format. Uh, understanding all of this process was necessary to us to, uh, to know in future how well the automation of the data in the uh, Translation of data in the dashboard will affect uh, will affect it. After that, the next important process for us was data pre-processing. Understanding each variable, what they meant, just not by definition, but from business application view was also important for us. And trying to find the inconsistencies in data was another important aspect before we went on to make the dashboard. Now, inconsistencies, I'm pretty sure you might have come across like null values and duplicates. Uh, we were also facing those problems, but just identifying that these are the nulls and these are the duplicates was not enough. We had to understand that was it was it generated out of an uh, out of an error in the data pipeline, or was it there for a reason? And if what is the reason behind it? For instance, if there's a logins column which records the login act, login time period of the person, if it's null, it means that the uh, user never logged in and it's blank so should we drop it might not be a good idea because that is just indicating us that uh, the user never logged in so the user uh, user activity uh, will be low in that area similarly uh, one important uh, another important thing we had to do was format the columns so the data was being generated on a weekly basis and the client also wanted a reporting to happen on a weekly basis so when we were plotting it on our graphs, they wanted on the x-axis the date should appear as weeks and not as days, months, and years. So we had to format the data by uh, applying different uh, by applying DAX query. It is a very powerful uh, Power BI uh, uh, feature to do direct data transformation. After doing that, uh, after after like mapping out all the data sources, variables, understanding it. Our next step was to visualize the data on the Power BI. So this is how Nubia's dashboard looked like. It's text heavy. It's not intuitive. It's just one big line chart with multiple variables, one unimpressive small headcount chart, which is also not like very readable. And too much is going on within this one dashboard. Uh, this was not helpful for them to generate the insights very quickly. So what we did was uh, we created a dashboard like this on Power BI. Um, I'll try to show if we can. Uh, yeah. So as you can see, it's it's very interactive, very intuitive. In one click, you can understand what is happening and what is going on. Uh, we have tables that summarizes everything there and. It's it's just very quick in giving us insights. Um, yeah. So what we did in that in this dashboard, we, we we separated each metric that they were plotting in one graph into different dashboards, get more in-depth analysis on each variable, and and it was like uh, more insightful for them. Uh, now uh, my team in the moment will tell us what we actually learned for the whole journey of our project. Thanks, uh, Anima. Hi again. So speaking of the reflections of what we actually learned from the project, not just in terms of technical uh, aspects, but 
uh, working with a client and in a live live setting. So first thing that we had to uh, we had to prepare ourselves was to like continuously engage with the stakeholders, which was Lulia Works and the client uh, in this case. And when we initially started working on the project, uh, the user stories of what the actual requirements were from the client, we we had them, but they were not very clearly defined on a granular level. So we had to continuously communicate with them and understand what the user stories were requirements were and try to figure out what we need to do. So for the requirements gathering part, we had to almost communicate with them once at least or in some cases twice or thrice in a week and figure out what they really want from the dashboard and visualizations and what sort of insights they wanted to generate from their data. And another point that we, we really uh, had to focus on was like to experiment different kinds of uh, for example, chart layouts or different dashboard design and uh, different sorts of um, transformations of the data available to make sure that uh, the client is really uh, liking what they're seeing or what we're generating. Because just generating a plot like a line chart or a scatter plot is it's easy, but the, the value we get from the plot is what's quite important for the client. The second most or the first, actually the most important point that we learned from the whole project is that it's different from actual academic projects that we do. Seeing the second point in that, one simple example is like the selection of color schemes for the for the plots we did. In, in our academic projects, when we have to work on a visualization for a project, we can just choose, like for example, colors we like. That's, that's totally fine as long as it meets the requirements for the post. But when we are considering the live project where the dashboard would be deployed in, in the software the client is building and planning to sell, we have to consider a few more things. For example, uh, when we were choosing color schemes, one of the suggestions we made to the client was to choose something called perceptually uniform color map. So what the perceptually uniform color maps do is they, they, one, one, one major advantage is that they are uh, easy on users or yeah, easy, easy on users who have color vision deficiencies or color blindness, for example, or if someone can't see a red or green color, and if you make a dashboard in all red, it doesn't help them like to see gradual changes. Another advantage of using perceptual uniform color maps was that the changes in the actual values are uh, shown in the same strength in the color change as well. I really encourage you all to like if you're if you're interested in data visualization and all, I encourage you to learn more about the perceptual uniform color maps because I think that they're, they're quite interesting and good to consider because the visualizations you end up building might be used by a lot of users who might have color vision deficiencies. And another point that we had to consider from the economic projects was that this this dashboard we were building was being deployed in, in live. So when we build the dashboards, for example, in our courses, you just get one data set from the professor, you build it, and you're done with the visualization. So the transformations that you make while you're building the dashboards, it works fine. But when we consider a dashboard that's deployed live, we have to make sure that the new data set that is uploaded to the dashboard, it goes through the same pre-processing that you did for your data set when you were building the dashboard. A simple example like Arunima mentioned is like removing the null values or not removing them. So once you do them when you're building the dashboard, you also have to make sure that when a user of the dashboard uploads the uh, new data set, the same transformations are applied. So yeah, these are our reflections as the team and uh, from learning. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, so thank you very much uh, for both teams to do this. Um, so we'll take questions uh, from a uh, virtual audience as well as a live audience. And I'm going to start it off first. So, so maybe I'll only ask questions maybe like two of you can do it, I'll have to answer. Um, so how did you get involved in ICE? Who wants to start that one? Okay, I've got the hour for You can be closer to each other. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Audi. Uh, so, when I decided on coming to Syracuse University, 
I talk to my alumni, I talk to three of the professors, and I got to know what I consult. So my my professors and my uh, my seniors uh, suggested me do not wait on apply on I consult. As soon as you see the opening on LinkedIn, LinkedIn page that I consult, you will see the LinkedIn page on I can about I consult and just see the application related to all there. Uh, just don't do for applications. You just start on keeping up apply and. Uh, as soon as we find the requirements, uh, requirements we need, and if your resume has the perfect match about the requirements, uh, we just we just pull out your resume and just get you for the interview. But I would say uh, keep on continuously applying as as you apply uh, again and again. Your resume it will be helpful for the resume to be on the top top of the database. And this is how I approached uh, Ravina uh, through LinkedIn. Also, I approached few of the previous uh, project man uh, managers who graduated and. Then I find to be a selling that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so I think that message is pretty clear. Um any questions? Oh yes. Go ahead. I have a question for the um second group. Is there any component with um continual training for the client? Like as you guys finish the project for them to maintain the database? The question was about continual training and so uh, that's a good question. That's what we are finding. That's the last phase of our project that we are working on because our player is also new to our client. So we are making a documentation on how we did and what we did and breaking it down to the smallest uh, definition so it's easy for anyone who is going to use it to understand it and they can implement it on their own. So we yeah, have the documentation part. That's actually a very important part in data science project and I'm glad you asked that question. So. Yes. What's the deployment cadence for the dashboard? No question about deployment. How frequently? So that's the that's the part we are still uh, discussing with the client. So they have two two sorts of clients again. Uh, our client also has uh, partners and clients. So one of them they probably don't want to deploy it in live, like because it has sensitive information about their employees and stuff. Um, so one option is to like provide them with the actual dashboard file we created and they let them to deploy it internally. And one more option is uh, to like like Arunima mentioned, the data is being generated at a week. At, yeah, it's it's at a weekly level. So the dashboard would be generated and, and I think yeah, the weekly report is generated every Friday afternoon. So probably yeah, once in a week to answer your question. Sure. Uh, I have a question regarding the data sets. Could you please elaborate more what kind of data sets you have invested and how do you gather those data sets? Were they come from a third party vendor? How do you go about collecting that data? Yeah, so talk about the data for both projects and also how big they are. Yes. So, talking about our data, uh, I mean, we cannot disclose all the information in the data sets, but it was a US census data we are working on. So it was kind of a similar data that you would find on Kaggle about the US census data. Mm -hmm. Just a little tweaking with data and talking about the data set was bringing in the attributes that were really important, collaborating with the clients. And this was about the data set, but uh, only the features, uh, different features in our database and the, the data set you find on Kaggle about the US census was the different, uh, of course the different, uh, different attributes about, let's say the city, the actual data set in the Kaggle will uh, just say the universal cities that have like, but, but this was actually real data. The clients they actually had, our, our, our clients, the employees they actually had, the information was very uh, private, private towards them. And this was this was actually how we gathered the data. We were also provided the data in CSV format. And uh, we actually played on data by bringing it into Excel as well as we also tried on different uh, techniques like bringing on tab to Power BI. Uh, dashboards was not the key factor we would like to work on, so that's why we went up with here our main agenda was to bring on the filtering feature in our database that could help physicians to uh, look at their clients more specific towards the area base. Just say if you want more clients to uh, take a look from Syracuse, the filter feature will just take a drop down menu and it will give you the way, a way option to look the look on the clients who are residing to Syracuse. So that was how we got our data and by a little bit of analysis we came to the conclusion. Yeah, in our case, the data was part of a pilot study that the client conducted. So it was not a very huge data set because like I mentioned, it's for one organization and they had limited number of users or employees. So we were getting uh, 
state of your own parameter employees information like the, the usage and it was for like four or five different categories so approximately five so five different csv files with parameter rules and i said 10 categories 10 columns yeah and talking about how we were getting it so the new team members were manually fetching it from the web page and then sending it to us so that's how we were getting the csv files for many projects, getting the data is a challenge, right? Yes. I, I have a question to the first group. So, uh, was there any sort of hypothesis testing done as well to identify the relevant features? Uh, so, the question was about hypothesis testing and uh, machine learning. So, uh, that is our next plan. Actually, we are doing. Uh, we are currently just building out the data and categorizing it using different kind of zip codes. But we will do the hypothesis testing. Only if the subject matter experts are interested in it. If they are not interested, we will not go with that. So the primary aim was, was to just add the filtering feature and like for every uh, micro and granular level of detail was provided to us by the clients. So as he wanted was to add his own custom which selected features, we made the code which was really flexible, uh, which allows the user to add his own custom which to the variables he wants. So that was the only first deployment part we had. The next deployment phase would be I mean, I'm not going to completely disclose it, but it's about data connecting, how we bring on our data to the cloud level, and then the development piece come, come, comes into play. But as such of now, we did not need any hypothesis testing, you would say, uh, which actually needed, but we didn't need this. I, even I don't know why, but that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, how much of your time do you contribute per day to this? And second question is, how often do you interact with your client? What method do Methodology do you follow? Like, is it agile or is it what for? What do you follow? That's a great question. So, the question if you were to focus on, like, how much maybe on an average week, on how much time you spend on the project, how much you expect to spend on the project, which might be different, then talk a little bit about the project. Uh, so, I mean, from my project, I would say we are using an agile approach. Yeah. Well, uh, so every week we have a meeting with, so most of the time we have internal meetings. Where the team just discusses what we have done so far, what we have to do next. And then sometimes we, we are by weekly, depending on our client's availability, we have a client meeting where the client gives us the next input for we check what we have done so far. And if they are okay with it or if we need to do any improvements with that, we do that and then we go to the next, I would say, sprint. So yeah, this is the approach that we follow and how long, like how much hours. Uh, depends, I mean, summer I had a couple of time, uh, so I used to usually give like 7 to 8 hours per week, but uh, given understanding the academic empty load we have, uh, it's usually 1 or 2 hours and really based on the requirements the client has, if, if it depends, uh, I mean, if there's something really important goes on for the week, you, you plan your week accordingly and try to give as much as possible, there's no limitation how much you want to give and how much you don't want to give, it's, it's really flexible. Uh, you just need the task to be completed. But as she said, we went on with Azure efforts and I think we all should be fine given the academic load we had. We had and the, we had to uh, commit ourselves to the items. So on an average basis, uh, given the academic load and throughout the semester, two, two to three hours. But if you have like a Thanksgiving weekend or something, where, you know, you can work like seven to eight hours. And, and I mean, I never checked on hours. hours. Uh, I did work because it was real fun. <laughs> and so, uh, one more thing I would like to add, uh, our clients already know that we are like doing part time and we have like other work to do, so they are very flexible with it, so you don't have to worry about the client like forcing it to work out. So for my project, uh, I would say we use a hybrid approach, mm -hmm. uh, so, it took, so what happened was it took me some time to understand the requirements. And uh, it went around like few weeks to gather the requirements because what I wanted to know what they were doing existing, the current application and what they expected from us. So few weeks went by understanding the requirements, <laughs> gathering all the data. And then once that was done, uh, we started working on the data set and uh, we first tried to, we did like various trials on how can we move further. So yeah, I think around. Yes. So, um, as the data analyst, we were spending around, like we were having one for what we, maybe once a week, and the time spent was around, like, uh, was for me personally, it was not more than two to three hours, depending on that person. Yes, about the <laughs>
I'm going to ask a question in a while, and then we'll kind of get back. So, I'll so um, you mentioned that one of the things you were you learned in the project, the project about both projects, was handling requirements for the customers and yeah. client, how they change and how they're and all that kind of stuff. It's very different than all the nice projects you get, which are under the yeah. really fun. So, if you get a project in your class that's undefined, that's because we have to get you used to what you're going to do like in the real world. So, but my question is a little bit more about um, other types of work. So, like what else? So, for example, talk about different technologies that you use, different machine learning models. How much of that did you learn because you had to do it for the project versus doing it in courses? So, you don't have to all the details, but at a high level, give people a feeling of how much did you learn by doing the project and how much did you learn by getting the Thank you. Uh, so, in my case, yeah, um, in my case, I never worked with Paul Beer before I started with this project. So I used Tableau for a second project. Um, so to answer your question, I I've never used Paul Beer before this. Um, so I did spend some time watching YouTube videos and for best practices. Yeah. So for me, uh, I came, I, I was introduced to data science by Professor himself. <laughs> I mean, I know, I knew a few analysis techniques earlier before coming into Syracuse University, but was uh, completely relevant about what machine learning is. Uh, so a few features we learned in throughout the class were like support vector machine and decision tree, all those three, four techniques. But uh, I had to do my own research and learn a lot about a uh, few of the features in uh, and I know a lot of packages for machine learning. So I had to learn a lot about packages and new different functions, uh, how the machine learning works for the category analysis, different values. And uh, I would say before uh, starting on anything, I, I, I felt like it was it would be a heavy job for me. But now standing here, I felt I learned a lot and uh, I'm just glad I didn't miss on this opportunity. Oh. So I have a little different perspective on this because as one of the project managers for the team, uh, I had uh, took the project management course and I definitely learned a lot from that uh, because it had given me an ex uh, exposure to what were the different models, as you said, agile and everything, waterfall, and even the waterfall, uh, SDSC cycle and everything. But of course, to uh, it was new for me to handle different clients in different domains. And uh, with each client, there is the experience you get, and you learn a lot from that. And applying those techniques that now I can say we used kind of a hybrid model that came with an ex uh, that came with a trial and error format, and I learned it with the uh, on go on go uh, project. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I think I saw a couple. Of things here. <coughs> sure. I just have a question regarding the after the deployment phase. So you guys told that uh, you did the project and you made it live in production environment. Now, how is it going to get handed over to the client? What's, are they going to take it over? Or you will still be the support person for this project? How is it going to be? Uh, that's a great question. So the question is, like, what happens going forward? Is this going to be a project for the next 10 years? Or <laughs> Um, so for our project, we're still discussing it with the client, like we mentioned. So some of them, they want us to like just give them the dashboard that we generated, so they can use it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're still discussing, but I don't see a scenario where we have to su support them like for a live deployment. I think they just want us to develop it and do a knowledge transfer through documentation that I don't even mention. So once we do that, I think uh, they'll take it over from there. Yeah. Uh, so, for, so for our project, that's actually the next part of our deployment. How we're going to hand over to all the employees and the client from the client side. So, once the code is ready, when the deployment, our development team has been done by the job, we are planning to uh, we are planning to give this code on the cloud-based platform where everyone could access it. And since uh, it's just a feature filter, filtering uh, program and not a dashboard. It's, it's, and it's, it's not considered based on the live data. It would be really easy to just 
uh, you know, constantly send it all over users where everyone could have the access. But I'm not really sure about when the time will come because this the development team still has to do the job. Also, one more thing that I would like to add: uh, before initiating any project, you have to like sign a non-disclosure agreement with the client. So once we meet their requirements, we are supposed to hand over all their documents and all the work to them, and then we are no longer like we don't participate in the project. So yeah, like to answer your question, we don't keep going on with the project. We have time for one more question. Yeah. I have a uh, question for the second thing. So, how many layers of user access management is there for the dashboard? So, depending on the client roles and levels which are there, right? So, for for example, director might have a different view. Uh, the manager might have a different view. I uh, have some questions about access and access roles, all kinds of stuff that you went to the class that you took information security. <laughs> yeah. So, we are concerned about none of that actually, because like I mentioned, we just have to build the dashboard and give it to them. Um, and the data we are getting right now is the file data that like she mentioned, and it's it's yeah manually fetched for us. So they probably might even like uh, filter out sensitive data and just give us the data they're okay for us to see. So all right, thank you very much.